The Department of Defense has released the names of all 13 U.S. service members killed in the attack outside of Kabul's airport. Twenty six August twenty twenty one, about one hundred seventy Afghan civilians and thirteen United States service members were killed in a suicide bombing at the Hamid Karzai Airport in Kabul, Afghanistan. One of those service members grew up about one hundred twenty five miles from where I'm sitting right now. East Tennessee is mourning one of their own. 23-year-old Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Kanas was killed in the attack. Major Katie Lunning is a nurse who has served in the National Guard and the Air National Guard. On August 26, she was on a deployment in Qatar. She had just finished working a long shift when her phone rang. I was so tired. I had just gotten back to my dorm room. I remember eating cereal, was jumping into bed, and my phone immediately started ringing, and it was my doc. He said, there's been an explosion, you know, back at the airport. We're going right now. And so there was no time to even think, except I was just exhausted. And my roommate, she was helping me shove stuff back into my bag, getting my dirty uniform back on, because there was no time for anything, and we were back to Kabul. And really, we had no idea what we were walking into. We knew that a bomb had gone off. Turned out to be that suicide bomb that killed almost 200 civilians and then our 13 U.S. service members. Major Lunning didn't just respond to the attack at the airport. She saved lives and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and named Airman of the Year by Military Times for her actions. My name is Josh Rowe, and this is... Tomorrow Town, Tennessee. You know, everyone who enlists, whether they want to tell it or not, has a story of why they enlisted. Um, what, what made you want uh, to be in the military to start with? I'm one of the 9-11 generations, so I had just started college, and we were, what, two days in to classes when September 11th happened, and I was standing in my dorm room watching the towers fall and everything lay out in front of us, and it just put the world into a perspective. You know, for an 18-year-old, I had just turned 18, that I was like, there's something bigger out there, and I wanted to give back. So I had an uncle that was in the National Guard. My dad is a Vietnam era veteran. So I knew that there was options out there. And I heard about the National Guard in my hometown of Minnesota. And I was like, yeah, I want to do it. You were a college freshman at the time. What, uh, clearly, uh, your life has taken a, 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 a different path than the normal college student. Like, what, what were you planning to do before that happened? Well, it's kind of funny. I was actually going to college for public relations, which would have been a disaster for me. <laughs> I had I have no passion in that at all. I have a lot of family nurses, and I just I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I just knew well people go to college after they get out of high school. So that was my plan was just you get out of college, you get out of high school, and you go to college. So I think that was part of it too, is I didn't feel passionate, I didn't feel driven towards it. And when I saw September 11th, it gave me a passion to do something and give back. I enlisted, I joined the National Guard. I had an opportunity to be a full-time recruiter. So I was full-time in the National Guard for about four years recruiting. And I was like, yep, it just kind of gave me that moment to think about what I really wanted to do with my life. And I was like, yes, I do want to go back for nursing. So I went back to being a part-time guardsman and used the college money and went to nursing school. So 2001, obviously, 9-11. We're 2024 now. When you, what year did you actually start? You're still in now, right? I still am, yeah. So, so, I mean, tell, tell me that. I mean, yeah. that, that's a long time. <laughs> it is a long time. And the intent was never to spend this long in it. I would have never imagined that I would. My intent was to join. I joined after September 11th. It was in 2002 by the time that I went to basic training. And every, you sign up for your initial few years and you just kind of keep adding on. Everybody's path is so different in the military. There's now one set story. So mine is just one story of many different paths that you can take. I was full-time in the National Guard. I was part-time traditional National Guard. I went to nursing school. I was enlisted for 10 years. And then I commissioned and became an officer after uh, I became a nurse. The thing you're probably known the best for is, is uh, from August of 2021. Tell me about I've heard you tell part of the story before about August 26, 2021. Uh, you got a call. Uh, take, take us there and tell us kind of what you uh, recall about that day. 
Sure. Um, to kind of set the stage for that day, uh, it was my first deployment as a CCAT nurse. So CCAT is critical care air transport team. We're a three person team of a critical care physician, critical care nurse, and a respiratory therapist with critical care. And we're a three person team that we're designed to pick up patients from point of injury and transport the most critically ill or injured to the next higher echelon of care. So it was my first intro into that CCAT world. I had done other nursing jobs, but this is my first time doing CCAT. And this deployment was to Qatar, and I figured it was gonna be a great way to just see what CCAT was all about. Qatar was very scheduled, it was, you know, not a lot of turmoil. It's a very safe country. And I arrived in July of 21. And as most people will remember, in August is when we watched um, the withdrawal happen way sooner than was anticipated and the Taliban taking over the country way sooner than anticipated. Very chaotic events. Our flights began around August 16th and it was just kind of nonstop transporting critically injured patients um, and evacuees out of Afghanistan. And August 26th was 10 days in. We were into that routine. My three person team, we had just flown from Qatar to Afghanistan, brought patients and evacuees back to Qatar. I'd been up for close to 30 hours after that mission because it takes about 20 hours to run that full cycle. I'd been up the day before um, helping with the evacuees as they were coming in because there's a lot of injuries as well. And I was so tired. I had just gotten back to my dorm room. I remember eating cereal, was jumping into bed and my phone immediately started ringing and it was my doc. He said, there's been an explosion you know, back at the airport. We're going right now. And so there was no time to even think, except I was just exhausted. And my roommate, she was helping me shove stuff back into my bag, getting my dirty uniform back on because there was no time for anything. And we were back to Kabul. And really, we had no idea what we were walking into. We knew that a bomb had gone off. It turned out to be that suicide bomb that killed almost 200 civilians and then our 13 U.S. service members. So we were flying to Kabul really with no idea of what we'd be landing in and what type of injuries or how many we'd be working with. We got to Kabul. Um, it was different than it had been before. All the chaotic crowds that were around the gates, if you remember what those looked like, they had all dispersed after the explosion and it was replaced with, um, it was almost like an eerie quiet, but you could hear lots of different sounds around the city. We got to our hospital. CCAT has to leave the airplane is the other thing. Our patients don't come to us. So we have to take our equipment into that chaotic, uncontrolled city, get our patients and bring them back to the airplane each and every time. So we went to the hospital. They were still triaging. There were surgeries going on. We had to work with, there was a coalition physicians on the ground on which patients we could take. And we brought as many as we could onto the airplane. We ended up with five critical care patients and 14 AE patients. And those are those medical surge level patients. And then we had to fly them to Germany. And that's almost an eight hour flight. So we we're up for a very long time. By the time it was all said and done into the 50 plus 55 hours that we had been awake, but every patient that we had on our flight landed safely and alive in Germany. The nature of the work you were doing even before that day, like you said, you were, you were going to injured service members, mm -hmm. pulling them back. That sounds like it could be dangerous at any point. And so you were kind of used to being in that situation where you could be in danger at some point? It, we were. Uh, they would give us a brief, like an intel brief, if you will, before every single flight, and they would tell us about all the scary things out there, all the rockets and shots that are being fired at airplanes, on the ground, getting through the gates. We didn't have a security team, it was us. So it's not like we were going in with a bunch of the big buff Marines, they were busy at the gate. So it was just us getting into the hospital and getting back out. So they would brief us on all, all the scary things. And my respiratory therapist, my RT, at one point he looked at me and he goes, scary stuff we can't control. And it made me laugh, but I was like, it is, it is what it is. And so we would say that to each other all the time. Well, scary stuff we can't control. And it just kind of got us into that mindset. Well, there we go. Scary stuff we can't control and we'd go again. <laughs> Any of us enlist, right? We we know that what the possibilities are. You know what you're you're signing up for, literally. That said, performing in that situation, not everyone does it well. 
and I, I don't know what the variables really, really are for that. I mean, there's, there's so, so when, when you think about what you were able to do in, a, in an environment like that, like, is there anything that comes to mind of, of, of what makes you think that you were suited for, for that or you were able to do that? It's a great question. And I honestly think a lot of it is the leadership I had up to that point always told us to be ready. We had almost joked about those words, be ready, because they had been told to us so many times. My commander would do a really good job. He'd brief us on what's going on in the world. And he always said, be ready. And it was that concept of you're an airman first. So yes, I'm a nurse, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be tucked safely away in a hospital. I'm an airman first. And it doesn't matter if you're a physician, board certified, you're an airman first and you're going to get the mission done. So I really think that it was just ingrained in me. And even I, you know, I give them credit now because at the time we always, we'd even joke like, oh, you know, be ready. But because they said that and because you were listening, you know, kind of like a parent and your kid, you actually are listening to what they're <laughs> saying. You know, I yeah. think I was ready and I knew I'm, I'm here, I'm ready and I can do this job. I think when people think, even people with prior service think of, of a, of a nurse, even in a combat situation, yeah, I don't know, think of maybe MASH or something. Like you yeah. don't think of of what you were specifically doing. Yeah. Um, did you know before the deployment this is what this is? This is this is what? Oh. No, not at all. <laughs> and CCAT, it, we were used a little differently, um, not outside of our scope or what we should be doing. Um, it's that mentality that you need to be ready to do what you're asked for. But traditionally, CCAT was not put into those positions because you're sending your mo some of your most trained people into very much harm's way. And so it was a concept that some people had a hard time wrapping their heads around that, you know, you're really risking the people to bring them back. And so it's not a traditional way that they had been used before. So appropriate, absolutely. Doing our job, absolutely. But it wasn't your normal sense of, yes, going out right into the fight and getting your patients. Heard you tell the story once um, about the Marines, uh, I guess as you were flying them to Germany, uh, the ones that were less injured, helping the ones that were more injured. T tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, you could, the camaraderie um, was amazing to watch. They didn't want to leave their buddy. And I have no idea if these people even knew each other or if they just recognized that they were fellow Marines and they were all together because I have no idea where they came from, you know, wherever that they were when the bomb went off. But we did. We had really critical ones that were on the ventilator, on all the life support equipment. And then you had ones that were more alert but pretty injured. And they would. They would help. They would. You'd see them grab their friend's arm, talk to them. One pulled a blanket up over his friend that was moving around. So through it all, you could tell, like, they weren't going to leave each other behind. And they were very serious about it. And when they would look at us, when we were working on them, you could tell they were like, you know, you're going to do a good job. And, you know, they had a lot of hope and trust in us and we didn't want to let them down. Yeah. My mother-in-law was a nurse during Vietnam at a hospital in Japan. And she tells similar stories of, of the, the soldiers that could getting up and help because they were understaffed, undermanned. Yeah. Obviously uh, uh, a lot of injured, you know, mm -hmm. that they're, they're helping. And so I think that is something that, that is I don't want to say it's common because I think that makes it even it feel not as, as interesting as it is because I think it's inter interesting that how that is the mindset of people in that situation to help each other. Yes, exactly. It goes back to that, like, why do you people run into a burning building, right? It's like that innate sense of you're going to help. You're going to do the right thing. The story itself of, of, of the airport attack, you know, is one of the, the 13 that died, uh, Ryan Canals, is from... Knoxville, uh, about an hour 45 from here. Um, so it's one of those things that when that happened, it, it, a lot of people here felt it in, in a specific way. Um, and I'm sure every community that lost someone, you know, feels that way. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things of, we get connected to those stories in, in specific ways, but at the same time, there are stories that we never hear um, or that we don't hear the details of that aren't as, you know, don't make national headlines like that, that event did. What, what, what has that been like to kind of, you know, I'm sure in the, year, in, in the time since then, learning more about 
all the things around it. Because at the moment, I'm, you're just doing your job, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes, uh, there were stories coming in quickly uh, when we got back and in the year after it, talking to other people. But even, you know, we're a couple of years out and I'm still learning about things or seeing things. I was like, oh, that's what happened. It's kind of putting those pieces together, if you will, of, and I think the families are still trying to put pieces together and everybody was there and even wasn't there. You know, we all have questions and it was just, there were so many things going on, such a big timeline, just trying to, you know, how did it all happen and what, what part of it that you were in. I love connecting with other people that was like, hey, I was there. I was actually, you know, I just met a girl that was in LUD and she was helping the evacuees coming in. She works at my VA. We were deployed at the same time and all of a sudden we run into each other. So it was like, I would love hearing her story and how she was able to help and how she pitched in. You realize you tell this story like you just happened to be one of the people there, mm -hmm. but yet <laughs> you received the Distinguished Fly, distinguished fly, fly Cross mm -hmm. and Airman of the Year. Mm -hmm. No, who, who, who awards the Airman of the Year? Is that for Military me? Times. Military Times. Mm -hmm. So you've been singled out for your role in this, um, which is hard to, to tell from the story, the version that you tell. What, what specifically um, are you doing? What, what are the things that, 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 that stand out to you about that day as far as the, the situation that you were in specifically? Um, truly, it, it was my team. Um, there was nothing that any one of us like stood up and did something super different. If I didn't have my doc and my RT with me, and if they didn't have me, hopefully they'd feel the same. You know, it was a three person team and we all had to be in it together. So we all had to be packaging the patients together, which is very dangerous. Um, when you're moving in a patient off their equipment onto our equipment, it's one of the most dangerous times. And we had things happen, you know, that all three of us had to work really quickly to correct, to make sure the patients were safe. So truly it was our team and we worked together. And I'm just very appreciative of the people who saw us working that hard and working as a team. And they're the ones that decided to write uh, for the Distinguished Flying Cross. And I'm just very appreciative that they looked back and was like, wow, look at what medical's doing. Um, because I know that they're, I think we're, uh, they said it was like 12 women total have gotten the DFC and only a few nurses. So, but I know that there's been nurses who have done incredible things across military history. So I just hope that when they see another nurse getting it, it just kind of brings up that conversation and awareness of what nurses are doing. What has that been like to, to, to get the notoriety? How, how, how have you uh, processed that? Um, I personally hate it. <laughs> and truly, um, I love talking about the story though, because I want people to remember what happened and I want people to remember the 13 who are unfortunately killed. And I think by telling this story, it helps keep their memory alive. And my story, it was one piece of the puzzle and it helps keep those stories alive as well. So I am happy to talk about it for that fact is like, I want people to know that you have really great medical people in the military and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that service members get home. There's a Medal of Honor Heritage Center here in town and they, they'll bring in once a year a recipient. And I've talked to, I don't know, half a dozen of them. And they're all the same, the same way that you're describing this of kind of a why me specifically, or I didn't, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. And I know no one sits down with you guys and says, answer questions like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know that hasn't happened. What, what, is, what is that? Because that, there's something specific about members of the military that are honored for their valor, their, their, you know, their courage. Um, that there's something about that, that, that seems to be, uh, uh, I don't know, difficult to, to, to work through in some way. I think when you're in the military and I'm sure that you experience this too, you learn to be a team. Like everything from the beginning is your team, your battle buddy, your wingman, you know, your service before self. It's not about me as a person. So I think for me anyways, that's what it is. It's not about Katie. It's about our CCAT team or it's about our, you know, what we did together. And I think that we're just ingrained in helping each other out and being there for each other that it's hard to feel singled out for one thing when you know that you're working with so many others. But you also live in our culture and see you know, there's, there's a lot of look at me type mm -hmm. stuff in this, in, in this world. And, yeah. and, you know, so you, you, you see that stuff, but that's not, 
that, that's not how you see this. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe that's what makes the military pretty special. And maybe that's why I've stuck around for so many years when I thought I would just do a couple of years and get my school paid for is I love the team aspect and I would do anything for my fellow airmen and my wingmen. I had the opportunity to talk to Major Lunning when she visited Chattanooga to speak at an event for an organization called Freedom Sings. Bobby Allison Stanifer is one of the co-founders with Freedom Sings, and she made the connection. The organization is just outstanding. It's a national program that helps veterans heal from trauma by telling their stories through music. Tell me how you got connected with Freedom Sings and, and Bobby. So a couple years ago, the VA partnered with Freedom Sings and the Office of Nursing Services wanted to branch out and allow nurses who are also combat veterans pair up with Freedom Sings and go through their process of meeting with the, sing the songwriters and telling their story through song. It was really successful in 23. And when 2024 came around, they wanted to do it again. And I was selected out of 10 of them uh, to participate. What does telling your story feel like in a, like a public setting like that? I had gotten pretty used to telling my story in a public setting uh, ever since the Distinguished Flying Cross. I've been an interview or I've been happy to share my story because I feel like it's more sharing my team story and I want people to know what was done, you know, not just what we did as a team, but what other members were doing during that time. So I've gotten used to telling it. I had no idea how to prepare to tell it through a song and I had no idea what I was getting into. I literally got a phone call via Teams at work and was like, hey, you've been selected for this. And I didn't know what I was getting into, but so I just jumped in and I met with Don, Don Goodman and Steve Dean and Bobby. And it was just such a natural process. They, you're not just sitting there telling it. I mean, you're just having a conversation and before you know it, they've turned it into an amazing song. Do you feel um, that it's helped you? Do you feel like that, that, can you see from that process how it, how it, how it does help other veterans? Absolutely, I do. It's an amazing program. It is so different to, than just verbally telling your story, but to hear it sung in such a creative way, and it's just put into a different way too. It's phrased differently, and you can tell that it reaches more people. A big thank you to Major Katie Lunning for this conversation. And we'll have much more with Freedom Sings coming soon on... to Morrow Town, Tennessee. This podcast is a production of News Channel 9, Fox Chattanooga, and Sinclair Broadcast Group Chattanooga. I hope you join me again real soon. <laughs>